What's going on, Chavez Slovakia? It's your boy Chavez here. So we're back again for some more fancy content by Internet Historian. And this t-shirt fits me immaculate. My shirt is also very fancy. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> All right, so we're back again for more stuff. Too fancy, too furious. Yeah, this guy's parody game is on point. In case you didn't know, that's a reference to Too Fast, Too Furious. Which was the best Fast oh. and the Furious movie to be created. I don't know, man. In the in the one we just watched, they went to space. That shit was, like, hilarious, but also kind of whack. Like, it was so overhyped. How do you do that? It was great. It was very camp. I enjoyed it. Dude, we're so far into the universe of Fast and Furious. We'll get into it later. Let's do it. Come here, little fella. I want to tell you a secret. It's a nice I'm just like you. No, you're not. We're both down here in the dirt. Mine <laughs> just happens to be imported. <laughs> you are fighting in traffic, and I am fighting charges of trafficking. We're Damn. so similar. Damn. You're working a nine to five job, and I am having to look at that. <laughs> We're both going through it. So don't hate me. I'm not the problem. It's the wine snobs. They're not the, the ones Tory that look down on And Carlisle. And frankly, I don't blame him. I don't blame him. Uh, no, no, he's learning. Listen, <laughs> let me pull you up so by your bootstraps. Not my bootstraps. What if I made you my little you. pygmalion? That's a uh, reference that you wouldn't get. You know what? Perhaps <laughs> so I shall make a series of videos that will give you some sort of clue about fancy things. Yes, that's what I'll do. Something to give you just enough information to bluff your way through a fancy dinner. Did you know that Dan Vinci painted the Mona Lisa? Somebody had to hold open the gates for the barbarians. Why not me? <laughs> so let's do it. Let's look at... <laughs> That was rude as hell. Oh that God. was rude as hell. <laughs> wine. The Mountain Dew of upper society. Oh, With wine, there is only one rule. Kill or be <laughs> killed. Oh, my God. <laughs> he's, like, he's like relating it to things that broke people can relate to, like Mountain Dew. Like, oh. <laughs> I know what Mountain Dew is. <laughs> it's a delicious drink that also shows status. I used to hate Mountain Dew. Do you have the Mountain Dew cold red? Code red. Is it code red? Yes. I thought it was cold red. Why would it be cold red? Because it's a cold drink. That makes way more sense than code red. Code red is like an emergency. I low-key want to edit that out so nobody knows that that's what you thought. Well, then explain Baja Blast. <laughs> because, you know, Taco Bell is Mexican, and there's Baja California. Which is full of Mexicans? Baja. It is Mexico! Uh. Baja California is Mexico! So it is full of Mexicans. That's a fair statement to make. <laughs> We're moving on. And if you want to survive the night, here are six things you should know about why. Okay. To you, muggles. The words on these bottles must seem like a mystery. Pie not no iron? But us landlords, we, the pink <laughs> Himalayan salt of the earth, we know what they mean. They are grape names. Yes. Look upon this grape vine. It okay. makes grape berries. Boom. Now, there are many different species of grape berry. And whatever the berry species is will determine the type of wine. This is Chardonnay, so it will make Chardonnay. Merlot oh. grapes, they make Merlot wine. Ah. Grape names are mostly French, gross. But for example, in English, <laughs> Pinot Noir means black pine, because it kind of looks like a black pine cone, if you okay. squint. Here's some of the other names. You can pause it. I'm busy. Wine grapes There's are so not many. like the kind you get at the supermarket. Those are table grapes. You can think of that it kind of like, like the difference yeah. between cooking I chocolate like and regular chocolate. You can eat them, Ugh. but they're overly sugary and kind of full of seeds and just not as nice to snack okay. on. So the grape type is the main word on the bottle, but sometimes 
there are other words as well. <laughs> right. For example, this Borgogny. What the hell is a chablis? It's all regions. Allow me to explain. <laughs> Through the it's like the whole champagne is only champagne if it comes from champagne. Yeah. It's like that whole thing. Through the medium of song. Oh, there's Chianti and Pibonet. Also, there's Burgundy. Don't forget Chablis Bordeaux. This one's from Italy. This one's from Italy. This one's from France. This one's from France. This one's from France. This one's from France. This, one's from France. this, this they're all from France. We're Italy. Look, the general rule is: if you see a term you don't understand, it's probably just the French or the Italians being all la di da about their particular Super region. Fancy. All right, let's move on to price. All right, Come on, let's do I know it. a place. Ah, Box we're here. Line. I can tell by the name on the sign. Now, don't embarrass me, I didn't bring my ID. Fiddle TD, look at all these bottles. So many options. Ooh, a cheeky $200 bottle. And here, oh, a $20 bottle. Oh my god! Now, I bet this $200 bottle tastes way better, right? Like, it's gotta be 10 times better than this one. That's just basic math. Right, yeah. Go on, though. You choose one. <gasps> oh, no. Damn. Damn. Well, it was supposed to be a trick question, but uh, they both taste pretty similar, right? There's not some threshold that you get to where it gets more expensive, and then it tastes better, and then more expensive again, and it tastes even better, until it gets so expensive <laughs> and so incredible that it's like nothing you've ever had before. Break right. through the condition. This is just old grape juice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you're a little bi-curious about a more expensive really bottle, funny. sure, why not? Gold letters grace the label, hand engraved by goldsmiths. <laughs> Famed <laughs> wine <laughs> critic described the taste as mind-boggling. But realistically, after about $60, mm. the flavor doesn't get much better. In fact, it plateaus out and it can even go down. Source, the best quality to price ratio is all the way over here, much lower. About 20 bucks. That's how much you should spend on a bottle of wine. That's good, because that is how much I spend on a bottle of wine. But, like, if you go out to any place in Vegas and they offer you a wine list, the wine list has got maybe two wines for $20. Oh, yeah. And, and that's like, per glass. And that's the glass. Yeah. You'd be lucky to find a place that'll give you, like, a $9 glass of wine. You know? Yeah. Like, they want you to pay for the bottle. With like two glass, you want to get two glass for the table? I want you to pay for the bottle for me. Absolutely, yeah. It's a racket. Now, some people will say that I'm putting my heart and soul into this thing. I'm making an art, a form of art. How much is that worth? How much is art worth? Sixteen dollars and forty-seven cents <laughs> plus tax and tip. Twenty-eight dollars at the end of this transaction. If I door dash it, thirty-five dollars. That's my price. What do you got? According to Total Wine, it's worth about twenty-one ninety-nine. Well, you know, that's prorated. And if you really think about it, that's like you making a lot of fucking money. <laughs> you make them by the barrel. I buy it by the bottle. Oh my god! You're on the way up. About <laughs> twenty bucks. Ah, but what about the Vintage? Oh, nice. Whoa, look at this. Nice. A couple of cromulent slender necks. And they're the same price as well. But this one is from 2019, and this one is from 2022. All right. Well, surely the older one is the better one, right? No. <laughs> Many people think that wine aging goes like this. Okay. And the flavor just keeps getting better over time. Why not? Wrong, wrong, wrong. The wine at the store has already been aged at the winery. Right. I don't need to be more aged by sitting on this shelf and just collecting dust. Right. Or spending years at the back of your pantry at home. If I'm for sale, I'm ready to be consumed. I'm ready to have your hot lips wrapped around. <laughs> oh my lord! In fact, the general rule goes a corked bottle should be drunk within five years and a capped bottle within one year. Oh really? Not that that come, fast? Come, there's more. Really that fast for like the twist offs? I guess. My wife wouldn't know. She finishes bottles. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a bottle last that long. No, you know who really likes drinking wine with my wife? My grandmother and my sister. They'd be like, yo, are we playing spades today? Are we flipping them? 
And what they really mean is, how many bottles of wine should we bring? Let's pretend I am a waiter at a restaurant. You happen to be wearing a shirt, and so I have mistaken you as a paying customer. As a waiter, the first thing I will press you about will be food pairings. Mm. Yeah. White wine with fish? A Merlot with pork? <laughs> well, kid, I'm going to have to pair this truth nugget with something <laughs> you don't want to hear. Facts and logic. The food pairing doesn't really matter. It really doesn't. It's all completely subjective. It's cuisine by horoscope. It's food astrology. Right. That's facts. That is true. But occasionally, they be on that shit. <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, sometimes you be like, hey, bro, that shit hit. Now, yeah. Sometimes it's not for you, but a lot of times the waiter will just give you like a sample to taste, and then you can try it, and then they'll just take you in a completely different direction. Yeah. But it's kind of hard because, like, so many different kind of wines are suggested for different foods. Where do you start if you don't have an opinion and that's that's kind of where astrology comes into play there. So, like, this is where really the tasting notes uh -huh. come in. Uh -huh. <laughs> and right. I say that <laughs> <laughs> because where I used to work at, we had this wine mm -hmm. that I hated, mm -hmm. but it tasted like bell peppers. Uh -huh. Not That a sounds joke. horrific. Yeah, it's not a joke, not an exaggeration. Right. You, like, drink it, and you're like, that is that is a green bell pepper. Right. That, that is a bell pepper. But it went so well with one of our salads every time somebody was like oh i'm just i'm just gonna do a salad for dinner i was like i mean you're being so good with the salad why don't you why don't you treat yourself to this wine i have this wine that pairs really nicely you know mm -hmm. and it was great and you got to pop the cork in front of him and everything and oh no like i made other people do that because i'm bad at that hand part. behind the back and you Smile as you pour it. I'm bad. I'm bad at. I'm bad at taking the corks out of wine. So I used to ask other people to do it. <laughs> just like, just, just like. Wait a minute. Wait a second. There was there was one time I was trying to uncork a bottle of wine, yeah. and it literally took me so long that the guest literally just took the bottle from me <laughs> and did it himself. <laughs> And I've That's never so been good. so humiliated in my life. He's like, just give me the goddamn drink. Liaise in the comment section. They are bullshitting to upsell. Ah, uh, get the more expensive one. It goes better with the spaghetti. Or <laughs> they are a Pisces and you shouldn't trust their opinion <laughs> anyway. Something else to expect at a restaurant? That's such a good joke. Expect to get ripped off by the markup. Mm. Most restaurants add That's a 250 to 300% markup on their wine. And the cheaper the bottle, the higher the proportional markup tends to be. So a $20 bottle will turn into an $80 bottle. But a $100 bottle may only rise to $150. Right. Most people get the second cheapest bottle on the menu, regardless of the pairing, and that'll do just fine. Yeah. It and that's it. No matter. more tips. Unless you want to leave me one. Huh? Actually, you know tip. what? i got a fucking tip for you, mate. Add time. Nice. Yeah. I bet you're wondering how I got this cog in my knee. <laughs> oh, do you think it hurts to laugh the way he laughs? <laughs> no. <laughs> that doesn't sound like it like kind of hurts a little bit. The <laughs> no. I don't think that's how comfortable. All right. Cog in my knee. This is coming from two people with goofy laughs, so we can laugh at other people's laughs because we laugh funny. I'm not laughing at how he laughs. Only he's laughing at how he laughs. <laughs> This man all the way under the bus. It's funny. What else? What do you want to do? I think it's a normal laugh. I don't think you laugh. Bro, funny he at does all. it at every one of these ads. Because like it's funny. He makes himself laugh. I'm just saying, bro. That's because I became the face of Incogni, <laughs> the service that helps you be forgotten on the internet. I used to be a humble florist. One day we received a, a shipment of forget me nots. <laughs> but inexplicably, I fell in. And Damn. ate a bunch of them. Why? I forgot everything that day. <laughs> my address, my web browsing habits, where I worked, what my child's face looked like. Damn. I was supposed Damn. to pick him up from daycare, so that was kind of embarrassing. I just picked one of the kids that, that kind of looks like me. We will see. Close enough. Have you ever signed up for some dodgy website? Have you ever dodged up for a legitimate website and they sell all your details on to a dodgy website? That's where I come in. Incogni man. And a nonna boy. 
There are data <laughs> miners out there, data collectors, creating big servers all around the world. They take your name, your address, and your IP. <laughs> together they make a big profile, and that lives forever. I am here to send them annoying legal notices to tell them to fuck off. Take Steve off your database. European law this, American law that. Go to incogni.com slash internet store to get 60% off an annual plan. The cog signal. I swoop into the data centers. Legal notice. Tangle up their processes with admin. Who are you? I don't know. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Ingenokni Nam. Go to incogni.com slash internet historian. Alright. Ah, Incogni Man. Remember me? Nord! Oh. Yes. Nord, Nord. No. <laughs> Who's the kid? <laughs> That's a good deal. And over. Welcome to the Wine Underground. Okay. We have our meetings here because it stays at a very pleasant temperature. You know, us wine masons, we control everything. We are few, but many. That doesn't make sense. Look at the back of this bottle. See the No Fat Chicks logo? Damn! We put that there. Damn! It is the symbol of our organization. <laughs> we have a dirty finger in every glass of government and corporation stuff. Oh. If you cross us, oops, perhaps you'll have a little accident. Last year, little upstart. You've never seen those videos on TikTok? Bro, that was some insane shit. <laughs> There's videos on TikTok. <laughs> I can't believe I was waiting to see. So there's videos on TikTok, okay? And they are on like a staircase. Okay. And they will take a bottle of something. Okay. A glass bottle. Okay. And they will push it down the stairs. Why? To see when slash if it breaks. That's some insane, bro, are y'all okay? And they do it over and over again with different bottles. Sometimes it's jars filled with things. After oh, we wow. get off this video, I'm gonna show it to you. Oh, wow. Wine actually tastes good. You know, like how grape soda does. Ew. Cut him up so good he had to get stitches. Oh my god. We caught one reporter trying to dig around into our operation. We all know how that ah. one ended. Ah. With an airstrike. <laughs> all right, my little juice box. I'm going to let you in on a secret. Why is champagne called champagne? Well, I'll tell you. It all began in 1668. In the Abbey of St. Peter in northeast France, there's something spooky going on. Mm -hmm. It's springtime. And in the cellar where they keep all the wine... And people. Bottles would suddenly... <laughs> unexpectedly... Explode! Now this was especially common during morning mass. Ho oh, ho, that's Just a bad that one game. Yeah. Sometimes the explosions would cause little chain reactions, and bottle after bottle would break down the line, ruining the majority of the crop. Oh the God. peasants were frightened and also parched. Sacre Blue, lay wine. What is happening? <laughs> the monks would refer to this as the devil's wine. Lay wine is cursed. Le God, he must be anger at us. <laughs> we need a hero. In walks Don Perignon. He is just the man for the job. A Benedictine monk at the Abbey, he's got a new role, the Cellar Master. All right. And it's his mission to find out what the hell is going on here. So Don starts looking at all the bottles. And what he figures out pretty quickly is that the wine itself is releasing gas. Mm -hmm. The gas builds up pressure and... They pop. Okay. Why that is happening, he doesn't know. But it's his job to stop it. So he gets to work, trying okay. all sorts of things to stop his mortal enemy. It's the bubbles. In the first year, he tried insisting that only the youngest grapes be picked. That's Perhaps a good way to start. this will stop your bubbles. Yeah. And it didn't. The next year, he changed up how the grapes were pressed. Push harder, we'll squeeze out the bubbles. Ah. Son of a bitch. He tried picking the grapes very early in the morning and no other time. Nope. 
And on and on, the Bubbles would win the battle every year. For eight long years, he tried all sorts of different things. I feel like this really <laughs> and no strategy worked. It's like you got the dude strapped down. It's like, come on, Grape, tell me your secrets. Oh, Don't know the Bubbles. <laughs> Eventually, he was at the point of almost giving up. Until one day, hey. What if the wine is still fermenting? So he takes a couple of the bottles and he opens them and... Huh, it is. We ferment the wine. Once it's done, it goes into the bottle. How does it then start fermenting again? How is that possible? And here the mystery was solved. So it turns out in North France, they have very fast changing seasons. And owing to that, the yeast doesn't actually get time to do its job. Instead, it would get cold very quickly in the winter and all the yeast would go dormant. Then the winemakers would go, oh brilliant, fermentation slowed down, it must be done. They would then bottle it and they would store it. But wow. once summer came back around, wow. the process would spring back to life and carbon dioxide would build up and... Jesus. Okay, he thinks, I cannot change the climate. Perhaps I shall not win the war against the bubbles. <laughs> Now, the bubbles are his enemy, and he has another enemy. The English. Uh, Therefore, well, the enemy of his enemy or something. <laughs> anyway, he starts talking to the English, and he goes, Hey, how do you guys stop your bottles from exploding? And the British go, You what, my core? Well, peep at how thin the bloody glass be in it. Thin glass is the problem. Thank you for using this test as speech preview. For a paid version, please go to... See, the English have created new coal-fired bottles with much thicker glass. Dude, dude, that's such a cool thing because, like, of all the things he tried, he never thought to change the container. Right. That's, like, top three things. The glass is breaking. Change the glass. Then they put a cork in the top, and it allows them to make very foamy beer. That's right. He could just use thicker bottles and he won't have to worry about stopping the bubbles at all. <gasps> so Dom goes running back to France. He's panting. He's sweating. And there's bits of brie on his shirt. He's going, better bottles, better bottles. Everyone's confused and terrified. But they give it a shot. And there it was. The people of France loved it. I, I love this new style. Even the French royals were enjoying new wine TM. He even started adding extra yeast and sugar to really get the bubbles going. And so Dom Perignon had created what we call today champagne. Which is now, champagne. there's a 19th century marketing campaign that says the moment he uncorked his champagne for the first time, he tried it and said, come quickly, come quickly, I am tasting the stars. But that's actually a myth. He never really said that. <laughs> okay. There's still a problem. And this one, Dom cannot fix. The pulp. If you bottle wine while it's still fermenting Ugh. so that you can keep the bubbles in, you're also trapping in a bunch of dead yeast That's and debris disgusting. and gross particles too. Also, it's all cloudy. No, no, we want it clear. We want it crystal looking. How will we ever solve this problem? Dom dies. Dies. <laughs> if he's dead, he can't see that he failed. So that's like a win. He never defeated the bubbles or the pulp. That's so sad. What a sad life he lived. Why are you, why are you looking at it in such a bad way? <laughs> I'm just saying. Why are you smiling when bro, you talk about it? Bro, your life was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> your life was a failure and they named a uh, champagne after you. Good job. Good work. 1805. In walks okay. Madame Clicquot. She's just the man for the job. I'm Not also French. Like I have come to remove all Z little beats. I will clench my teeth together and go pitu pitu back into the bottle. Now, Bitch. Madame Clicquot was a very shrewd lady. Her husband died when she was in her early 20s. My husband is dead. Lol. And part of the estate she was bequeathed included a winery. She immediately got to work, making it into a successful business. I shall invent a process called lay riddling. Here's what you do, right? Okay. You put these bottles on a rack at a 35 degree angle with the top facing down. Okay. Every two days, she would give the bottle a little shake and slightly increase the angle. After eight to 10 weeks, all of the sediment would come to rest in the neck of the oh. bottle. Right, quick tangent. 
Did you know that when you increase the salt concentration in water, you can drop its temperature down much lower without it freezing? Tangent yes. over. So she takes this sub-zero salt water and dips the neck of the bottle in there, then lets it sit until the neck freezes. Now you have a sort of frozen cork filled with all of the gross pulp, and then you simply pop off the top. And the whole thing goes shooting out as a fun prank for your friends and family. Then they add in a little more extra base wine and sugar and leave it to age. And with nice. that, Clico has just created a clear, sparkling wine. Wow. And that is Riddler. That and Madame Clico is... The Riddler. <laughs> so Don Perignon and okay. Madame Clico are both credited as the godfather and godmother of champagne. Today, the Dom and Clique brands are owned by LVMH, the same parent company that owns Louis Vuitton, Tag Heuer, Tiffany & Co, Hennessy. Actually, pretty much every luxury yeah, brand. But why is it Damn. called Champagne? Well, that's because it comes from the Champagne region, you dummy. Uh, uh, and anything yeah, else with bubbles uh, uh, is just sparkling wine. Sparkling wine is a higher order term. So, you know, like in science when they... No, they don't. They do. They no, they don't. Do things. The phylums. Talking yeah, about. there we go. Yeah. Sparkling wine is a higher order term. So champagne is a type of sparkling wine. There are many other types of sparkling wine, Prosecco being the most notable. Although its production process is different as instead of being fermented in the bottle, the wine is fermented in highly pressure resistant metal casks. Madame Clicquot also arguably invented the rosé. Also, many of these first champagnes were made using red wine grapes. End of part. On to the next. Oh, it's you. I was just looking out over the sunset. You know how it is. Thinking about stuff that happened right. in the past. Yeah. I remember it all too well. It was literally 1984. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I was walking home with my parents from the opera. Oh no. <laughs> there. Hey. Let's take a little shortcut, they said. We can cut through here. We were walking down a well-lit alleyway. It was nothing but quaint restaurants and bistros. Then suddenly, a man holding a bottle of Shiraz came out of nowhere. Just a tipple, he said. I was terrified. I knew nothing about why. Go on, he said. My hands were shaking, knees weak, arms heavy. Complex aroma, wouldn't you say? Ooh. Very good <laughs> tannins. Oh, really? Yep. What's a tannin? <gasps> I don't know. My parents died from ah! embarrassment right there on the spot. Mommy! I shot him with the bottle. I'm sorry, Daddy. Not the baby's Just a voice, tibble, bro. Tibble, tibble. It's too late for me, but I don't want the same thing to happen to you. That's why we have to learn about how to serve wine. All right. <laughs> so you've bought a bottle of wine to show your friends and family how successful and sophisticated you are. Did you know that Da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa? So let's go through how to serve the big three. White, red, and champagne. Let's say you've bought champagne. Oh, no. That bottle <laughs> goes in the fridge. Champagne is served cold always. To open, peel off the foil and do not aim it at your face. Then twist off wow. the metal thing. If you want people to think you're fancy, use the proper word, musolette. Musolet. It helps to contain the pressure. Again. Don't aim this thing at your face. At it's all. really worth repeating. At the all. PSI inside a champagne bottle is 70 to 90. Yeah. That puts it in the same league as a nail gun. Oh my so the cork God. comes out at about 50 miles oh an hour. And if you're in a house, you want to hold onto it very firmly with your hand. Yes. If you're Bezos, or you just won the Grand Prix, fling it over some ladies. I That's cannot stress funny enough. As hell. Do not point it at yourself. Do not point it at anybody else. You said you can't stress it enough. I cannot you, stress it enough. You said you cannot stress it enough. But like, why do you need to stress that at all? 
Because people will just do it. It's a bottle gun. People don't really realize Bang! until they're there. First of all, I think people think that it's fake. The banging is fake? How do we fake that? Why would we fake that? But also, you people don't really realize that it's like, like in movies, it's like a fun little pop. Ah, ha, 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 there's champagne everywhere. The focus is on the champagne. That cork yeah. can literally... First of all, can literally kill somebody, but can literally take your eye out. You'll take your eye out. That's yeah, not a joke. I think, That's I, for real. I think more likely, like, you're looking at knocking out some teeth, concussing grandma, um, mangling a baby. And also taking your eye out. Yeah. But if you want to be really fancy, you can use a sword. For think. This has Savory been a tradition for a couple easy. hundred years, popularized by Napoleon. After each victory, the army would use their sabers to crack one open for the boys. That's kind of cool. But the sword's just ceremonial. You can use pretty much any blunt object to knock off the top. A phone. A shoe. This fish head. <laughs> if it's cold, it shouldn't fizz over too much. But you might want to have someone on the side with a ready glass. The glass type cool. should either be a tulip or a flute. Although, if you've seen The Great Gatsby, you may notice classes. that they use these. Yeah. Up until the mid-1900s, people used coupes. That's because, back in the day, excessive effervescence wasn't very cool. So these cups helped actually dispel the bubbles faster. Yeah. Mm. In fact, sometimes they'd even use a small whisk or a fork to dissipate all the bubbles. So gross. Now, there's actually an old myth that the shape and size of the coupe was molded from one of Marie Antoinette's bimbos. Huh. But it's probably not true. <laughs> Please. Is he drinking milk out that, uh, out that titty? I'm out so that titty cup? Is he drinking milk out that titty cup? My man. But it's probably not true. Get him close the eyes. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> bubbles became a fancy feature, so the flute was adopted. They can be made from glass, but preferably they're made from crystal, so that they shimmer as much as possible. And the best flutes would also feature a small rough spot right there at the center of the glass at the bottom to create a sort of tornado of bubbles. Ah. Anyway, as you pour, Tilt sideways so it isn't all head, and don't pour more than two thirds full. Done. White wine. Okay. White wine is best served chilled too. 10 to 15 degrees though, not fridge cold. Use a small glass bowl and pour to about half full. And when you drink, do a little sniff test and you know, aerate it a bit. Then hold it down low on the stem so your hands don't heat up the liquid. If it's not to your taste, cut it with 50% Sprite and add a few ice cubes. Done. Oh, no. Reds. I told you. It, oh, no, no, the spritzers go hard. I'm just telling y'all. Believe in it. It sounds gross, but imagine you didn't know what was in it anyways. Like a flu shot. <laughs> just take it and shut up. Like, it might make me feel like shit. I'm still going to do it anyways. <laughs> Red wine is not chilled. It is served at room temperature. When you first open it, you're supposed to let it sit for a while to oxidize. That gives it more flavor. Although, if you don't want to wait, you can just pour it into a decanter. Yes. That does the same thing. To drink from, we want a big bowl on a stick. So you get a full face of the aromas oh of the God. great blood. <laughs> when you pour the thing, fill it about one third full. That's pretty much it. However, when it comes to wine snobbery, Red wine snobbery is at the top of the Maslow hierarchy. Reason. First white rock, it's like almost like a rock quarry. Oh my god, shut up. <laughs> and there's a taste testing thing that people do, and they all go a bit mental, and it's kind of gross, and it looks dumb. But if you think you're ready, ready for the ultimate test. Are you going to do it? Ready to take the one chip challenge of enology. enology. Then here's how you do it. When the waiter comes over, insist on taking a teensy sample. Inspect for color, clarity, and legs. Legs refers to how viscous the wine is. Yes. Smell it. Mm. Smells like a red wine. Swirl <laughs> it around on the table, making a loud scratching noise so that everyone knows you're a connoisseur. Swirling the wine glass is almost like turning up the volume on the stereo. When you taste what? it, you're supposed to get it over every part of your mouth so that when you brush your teeth Stop later, it's awful. 
Then take in big sips of air. Yeah. This is where you I... comment on the texture and taste. <laughs> Complex notes. <laughs> you yell across the room. Now this is the best part. You can just make shit up about <laughs> vanilla smatterings <laughs> or citrusy undercurrents. Yeah. I swear, there's a hint of blueberry. It's one of those things that's kind of true, but subjective enough that no one can really refute you. All you gotta do is say that you're getting notes of cherry or stone fruit. You're good. Okay, that, those are some good. Good, those are safe bets. Oaky, right? Yeah. You say, like if it's a white one, you oh, it's, this is really oaky. This is really bright. So make a big show of it. There is a little bit of an earthiness, almost a graphite clay note to this. It's a little bit meaty. It's a little bit sort of um, uh, uh, rustic. There are. Oh, those are good words. Yeah. What the fuck does Absolutely. meaty mean? Absolutely. What the hell are you talking about right now? And it's so funny because when I was taking like my little wine classes at the job that I worked at, yeah. they would say these words and I was like, this just tastes like a red wine that I like slightly more than the other red <laughs> wine that we had. I was like, like I taste it and go, it's kind of sour and thick. Why is nobody <laughs> saying sour and thick? This tastes like wine. <laughs> this has it's got crazy. like a this has got like a wine film on it. But I don't talk about the wine <laughs> film on my teeth. Definitely hints here of Monster Ultra Sugar Free. If this is a <laughs> taste test good. and you're sampling dozens of wines, you want to spit out the sample yeah. into this gross bucket so you don't get too drunk. The fuck are you talking about? Drink that shit. If you go to a wine tasting, drink all the wine. <laughs> Do not stop drinking the wine. Rinse your mouth out with like a neutral, you know? A lot of places will provide stuff too. Yeah, yeah, yeah provide that. Don't spit that. It's expensive what drink you're paying that for. Shit, bro. Drink that wine. Do not ask the waiter if you can drink from the bucket. It's the waiter's oh, privilege and God. he's very protective ah! of it. And that is how to serve wine. Why would you do that? Okay, that's a lot of shitting on wine, people. And we shouldn't get bullied. <laughs> but let me do a quick 180. Because overall, wine is good. And a little wine snobbery can be good also. Being into wine is one of the great dad hobbies. Mm -hmm. One day you will have a model train set in your basement, oh complete with a little walking path and the grass just right. The best part about this hobby is building the thing, getting it just perfect, and then making people sit there while you explain <laughs> the little trains in excruciating detail oh of how God. they work. <laughs> the fun of Warhammer. That's when you save up for the little space marine man, mm -hmm. you take him out of the packet, you put on a podcast with some Warhammer in the background. Um, of all the Primarchs, Horace is the best kisser. And you slowly paint it yourself. <laughs> that's, that's so hilariously accurate. And then you argue with your mates later about why the Necrophiles are the best race. There are people that spend like tens of thousands of dollars on coffee machines and equipment. And then it takes like an hour to make a coffee. And it's like only 5% better, maybe, than the ones yeah. you get at the cafe. He's like, now, I could be it. Mr. Killjoy and come in and go, what's the point of that? Why not just buy it from the cafe? Why not just get a pre-painted space marine? Why not have someone else just install the train set? I but then there's no that. ceremony, there's no fun, there's no hobby. Wine is very similar. The getting a little bit too obsessive about the thing and being like... Some lemon, lemon zest as well, lemon pith. Mmm, super tangy is the purpose of wine. <laughs> it's the fun of wine, which is why <laughs> wine is better than just some old grape juice. And you fucking wine loser snobs, you know what? You're all right. He's like, he's like, he's like unsuccessfully playing both sides right. of the argument. He's like, yeah, it's okay, but you suck. No, that's good. That's really good, man. I kind of thought he was gonna get into like the different, um, like, I don't know how to refer to, like, governing bodies of wine. Oh, okay. That, yeah, like, like what? I don't remember. I don't what even know what that means, governing bodies of wine. Yeah, like, that was a weird way for me to put it. Okay. But, like, they, they're basically the people who are like, oh, this wine meets this specific standard. Like, so you can have this stamp yeah, on Yeah, like the NATOs of wine. Yeah, I kind of thought it would get into some of that, too. The labeling, I know, is really important for a lot of wines. Um, but these videos are always really fun. I like when you get to like these niche groups and stuff that are actually really, really popular. Right. If you also have strong wine opinions, please let us know in the comments below. It's not something that I'm that into, but I, I'll drink it. I'll follow you. 
We can go to the same store. You can tell me what to buy. We can taste it. I'm down with that. I love suggestions from people who've done all the work for me. I don't drink expensive wine. I've had expensive wine. It tastes like wine. So as much as I'm very much like, I think it's impressive when people can identify certain things about wine or whatever, I'm going to keep buying my $8 bottle of barefoot wine, <laughs> cupcake wine. All right, we'll see you guys in the next one, man. Peace.